In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, all praises to, to the Master of the universe. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, but Muhammad is his messenger, but Ali is his wali. Um, I know everybody's probably tired, so I'm trying to keep it somewhat short. So, if I could get a show of hands, how many people here are engineers? So a lot of a lot of guys. I don't know about the sisters, but a lot of a lot of guys are engineers. So um, there was a plane. It had 10 engineering professors in it, and they were about to go to a conference. And um, right before they were about to leave, the crew announces that this plane was designed and built by the students in the engineering school. So nine out of the 10 professors get up and leave the plane immediately, and one, one professor remains in the plane and he's still reading his book. So one of the students goes up to the professor and says, we appreciate your confidence um, that you're still here. And he looked up and said, if this plane was really built by my students, then I'm sure it's not going to fly. I know the theme of today's event is to fly. Um, I know Malana Sabri talked about that, but, and, and inshallah, you will receive that tawfiq, but I'm just a student, and I don't really deserve to be here in front of you all, but I was given that um, responsibility, and inshallah, I will try to uh, impart some knowledge. I mean, what we learn at school is how to copy and paste, so I've copied some information on the web, and hopefully you'll find it useful. They did announce me as a doctor, I'm not a doctor. I do have friends who call me Molana, and I think it's because they once saw me say no to my wife, so since then they've respected me, thought I was a Molana. But um, the, the, the thing that I wanted to talk about today, especially towards the youth, is that there's two approaches we can take towards Maharam. There's an intellectual approach, and there's a traditional approach. The traditional approach is that you come, you attend the majlis, um, you do sinazane, you cry for Imam Hussein, and then you go home, and then you come back next year, and you repeat the same process. The intellectual approach is that we take time to reflect upon the reasons for why Imam Hussein um, went through this ultimate sacrifice, why he sacrificed his, his, his dear family and his companions. And what does it mean? You know, oftentimes in history, you'll see great personalities who make decisions that their contemporaries don't agree with or don't understand. But it's only with the passing of time that they realized that they were correct, that the decisions they made were in fact the, the right decisions. Imam Hussein, this was true in the case of Imam Hussein. We, when we think about what happened, you know, Muawiyah, who was the son of Abu Sufyan, he had, through guile, through deception, through some conquests, some wars, he was able to take over the leadership of the Muslims. He took it over after Imam Ali had passed away. And he had signed a contract with Imam Hassan that when he, when he passed away, if Imam Hassan was still alive, that Imam Hassan would assume the leadership. If he wasn't, it would go to Imam Hussein. And the people, were still alive. The Sahaba, many Sahaba were still alive. Many of the people still had in their minds the sayings of the Prophet that Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein are the leaders of the youth of paradise. That I am from Hussein and Hussein is from me. And on top of that, they all knew that Yazid 
was a corrupt drunkard. So unlike his father, he was completely um, unabashedly kafir. You know, he was the devil incarnate. His behavior, his actions were not those of a Muslim and he wasn't shy about covering that up. So in order to have some credibility, in order to be able to take over the leadership, he had to get the guidance of Imam Hussein. He had to get the, the bayat from Imam Hussein, the allegiance. So he immediately informed the governor of Medina. So Imam Hussein was living in Medina with his family and companions. He informed him that you must get the bayat from Imam Hussein. Now Imam Hussein, um, being who he was, there was no way he was going to pledge allegiance to a corrupt figure like Yazid. So he only had the limited choices. And we should think about those choices and try to understand and comprehend what those were so we can understand the meaning of Muharram and Ashura. Last year I actually went with my family to Erbain and we were, I remember being in the masjid of Imam Hussein. I was there on the day of Erbain for Fajr. And I was sitting and it was packed and there were so many people. It's just like here, you know, you can't find a place to sit. It was just like this, but it was much larger. And people were trying to jam inside and everybody was just trying to find a spot so they can pray Fajr because that was considered a big deal to pray Fajr on the Erbain in, in the Masjid of Imam Hussein. So as you can imagine, people didn't want to get up and leave. So I was sitting here and just a couple um, spots next to me, there was a gentleman who was sleeping. And as soon as the Azan came and people started to get up for prayer, he got up and everybody around him told him, you need to go outside and make wudu. And he said, no, 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 I, I, I have wudu. I made wudu before I came to the masjid. And they told him, well, you fell asleep. You really, you need to, uh, it will be bata. Anyways, he argued and he refused to get up and make wuzu. So it was a form of ignorance. You know, it was like, he, he was so um, occupied with trying to follow the traditional sense, the traditional um, steps involved with Islam, that the importance of being there, that he didn't sit down and comprehend and think what was going on. And if the companions or the people during Imam Hussein's time took just maybe an hour to think about what was going on, then I would bet you that the situation that Imam Hussein found himself in could have been avoided. And um, I wanted to just talk briefly about some of the options he had. So when he was in Medina, he had one, one option was just to remain in Medina, to stay in Medina and um, ignore the death threat from Yazid. He was just going to stay there and the people, his friends were telling him, there's no way he can kill you. You have so many friends here. What do you, you know, there's, he, he can't do that. They would, he would fear an uprising from the Muslims. So that was option one. Option two was to remain in Medina but to raise an army. There were companions who were telling him, you know, we could raise an army. You're so popular, everybody loves you, they know who you are. Why don't you stay here, we'll gather an army and we could defend your station. Number three was to leave Medina and go to Mecca. And by going to Mecca, he would be farther from Yazid's army, he would have more time to consider his options and maybe even raise an army to go and attack Yazid and take over the, um, the station from him to become the leader. And then the fourth option was um, to condemn him publicly but to, you know, go, go either live a life of retirement or go somewhere far so that he can't reach him and his family. So those were the main options. Uh, they were plausible, you know, they were reasonable for a reasonable person to consider. But he took a different step, which seemed very illogical to a lot of people at that time. So instead of staying in Medina, instead of leaving as a fugitive, instead of raising an army, 
he decided to go straight for Kufa, straight into the lion's den where Yazid army was waiting for him. So this was um, a move that many of his contemporaries, many of his companions, friends, they just couldn't understand. Why would you take your, your woman, your children, and go and fight, you know, this, this army that, you know, some people were thinking, well, this must be suicide. Why would he do such a thing? So, um, and that's where we need to think, and we need to look at his options or his decisions. You know, why did he decide to go to Kufa? So let's think about what would have happened to him if he stayed in Medina. There was no doubt that Yazid would have tried to kill him. He would have sent people to assassinate him. And without Imam Hussein clearly, and you know, in front of everyone stating that I reject Yazid, I don't pledge allegiance to him, he could have pulled off, you know, with deceit, with manipulation, he could have been able to pull it off. He could have assassinated him and then told everyone that Imam Hussein did pledge allegiance to me, but he died, someone killed him, there was an internal feud, etc. So that was not a good option. Number two, he could have created an army. You know, there was a lot of people who were willing to fight with him. But what would have what could have happened if he had created, you know, formed an army in Medina? Well, we have historical evidence when we look back at what happened. Two years after Imam Hussein was sacrificed, Yazid actually sent an army and killed the companions and you know, um, raped women and destroyed um, the shrine or the, the masjid of Prophet Muhammad. They even tied their horses to the pulpit of Prophet Muhammad. So he had no shame. Yazid was not the kind of person that would care. And then people would have said, oh, look, Imam Hussein was fighting for power. This was a struggle for power. This was a struggle for um, influence. And he would have been blamed for creating this massacre at the Prophet's grave and killing all these companions. So that was not a viable option for him as well. So option three was to immigrate to a distant land, you know, just leave. But what would have happened? He would have left Islam in the hands of a corrupt ruler. And then we would not know, you know, who is right and who's wrong. The corrupt leader would have been able to do anything he wanted. He was the leader of the Muslims. He called himself Amir al-Mu'mineen and Islam would have been sacrificed. So he would have saved his family, but at the end, Islam would have been sacrificed if he had just abandoned. So in reality, he had no choice. He loved his family, he loved his children, he loved his companions, but he didn't go on a suicide mission. He went on a mission to save Islam because his options were severely limited and he had to put a, he had to take a stand. He was not, an individual that can just run away from his duties and responsibilities. Recite a salawat. Can we lower the lights, please? So I want to I want to take you to. Um, the time when he had arrived in Karbala and um, just imagine that we are there and we're thinking about or we're watching and we're seeing what has transpired over there uh, uh, during Ashura. Ali Akbar had given the Adhan. Everyone on the day of Ashura had prayed Fesh, the Namaz for Fesh. Yazid's men blew the trumpets to start the battle. The battle began. One by one, Hussein's friends and companions went to the battlefield and gave their lives for Islam. By their time, all his friends and companions were martyred. Anna, Muhammad, Zainab's young sons went to the battlefield and were martyred. Qasim, Hazrat Fatma's only son went to the battlefield and was martyred and trampled by the horses. Hazrat Abbas could not hear the cries of Alatash, Alatash, Alatash from his beloved niece Sakina. He went to get water 
and did not return, his arms were severed. Ali Akbar, the 18-year-old youth, went to the battlefield and was martyred with a dreadful wound in his chest. Since dawn, Imam Hussein had carried 72 bodies to the camp. Imam Hussein was thirsty, tired, heartbroken, but he kept on. Patience was his prayer, and sacrifice to save Islam was his goal. And Hussein, all Hussein was worried about was saving Islam. By Asr time, Hussein left with his baby, Ali Asghar, and his son, Sayyid al sajjad Imam Zain al Abidin, who was ill. Ali Asghar was very thirsty. Hussein took his baby son to get some water. Ali Asghar, the young soldier, did not get any water. Instead, he got an arrow in the neck. Imam Hussein and Bibi Rabab dug a grave themselves and buried Ali Asghar. Our poor Imam inflicted with so much suffering in just one day. Hussein is all alone, thirsty, tired, heartbroken. He stood in the center of the camp and cried out, My salam to you, O Zainab. O Um Kalthum. My salam to you, O Rokaya. O Kubra, O Sakina. My salam to you, O Rabab, O Layla. O Um Farwa, O Um Mafiza. Khodafis, Khodafis. All the ladies gathered around Hussein. They all cried and cried as they said their last farewell to Hussein. Zainab, Imam Hussein said, take me to my son Zain al Abidin. Zainab, let me say Khodafis to my son Sayyid al Sajjad. Hussein and Zainab went to Imam Zain al Abidin's tent. He was lying unconscious on his bed. Zainab shook his shoulder and said, Son Sajjad, your father has come to see you. Sayyid Sajjad opened his eyes. He saw his father who was wearing white clothes marked with blood spots everywhere. My son Sajjad, I've come to say Khodafis, I'm going to the battlefield. Why you, Baba? Where is Ibn Masahir? He died, my son. Habib has been killed, my son. Baba, Baba, Aina, Aina Abbas. Baba, where is Uncle Abbas? Kutl, my son, Kutl. Abbas has been killed, my son. Baba, Aina Ali Akbar. Where is Ali Akbar? Ali Akbar has been killed, my son Sajjad. Tears poured from Hussein and Zainab's eyes as Sayyid Sajjad inquired about Ali Akbar. Son Sajjad, don't ask me about anyone else, my son. Everyone is dead except for you and me. Sayyid Sajjad tried to get up from his bed. He said, Auntie Zainab, give me my sword. I will go to the battlefield. I will save my father's life. No, son Sajjad, no, you are too sick for jihad. Your jihad is still to come. Imam Hussein continued, son Sajjad, you will have a lot of work to do after my death. You will face lots of hardship and suffering. Stay on the truth path. Don't be afraid to fight for truth and justice. Just be patient, my son. Maintain your patience at all times. Allah is with people who remain patient. Patience, my son, patience. My son, convey my salam to all my friends, my Shia, when you reach Medina. Do tell them Hussein died for truth and justice. Tell my Shias to remember me whenever they drink water. Khodafis, my son, Khodafis. Imam Hussein and Zainab left the tent. Sister Zainab, my last will to you. I am leaving you in charge of this caravan. Take care of Sayyid al-Sajjad, my sister Zainab. I'm leaving Imam under your protection, Zainab. Oh, my sister, look after my little Sakina. She will cry a lot after my death. Tears flowed from Hussein's eyes as he spoke about Sakina. Sister Zainab, be patient. Patience, my sister. Hold office. Imam Hussein walked to his horse. Hussein had helped everyone to mount their horse, but now Hussein is alone. There's no one to help him mount his horse. Zainab saw her brother struggling to get on the horse. Hussein, bring your horse near my tent, my brother. Let me help you. Zainab held the reins as Hussein mounted his horse, Jol Jana. 
So Jana moved a few steps and stopped. Hossein gently stroked the horse's neck and said, My faithful horse, I know you're thirsty. I know you're tired. You've been helping me carry the bodies from the battlefield since dawn. My faithful horse, for the last time, take me to the battlefield. I will not bother you after that. Please, Sojana, let us go. With tears in his eyes, the horse turned his neck and looked down at his legs. What did Hussein see? Hussein saw his beloved daughter, Sakina, clinging to the horse's legs. Sakina, only four years old. Sakina, the answer to Hossein's prayers for a daughter. Sakina, who loved Hossein like Fatma loved Hossein. Little Sakina was crying and saying, Oh horse, do not take my father away. No, horse. No, you will not bring my father back. Since dawn, everyone who has gone in the battlefield has not come back. Please, horse, do not take my father away. I will not be able to live without my father. Please, horse, please. Hossein got off his horse. My darling Sakina, do not cry, my love. Did you not give me permission to go? Go, go and recite dua with your auntie and your mother. Your grandmother is waiting for me. Father, I'm so used to sleeping on your chest every night. Tell me. Father, how will I go to sleep without you? Father, one last request. Please let me lie down one more time on your chest, Father. Hussein lay down on the sands of Karbala. Little Sakina put her head on her father's chest. After a few seconds, Sakina got up and said, Go, Father, go. Khodaf is my father. Hossein mounted his horse and headed for the battlefield, thirsty, tired, wounded, and heartbroken. Hossein was not a coward, he was brave and strong. Hossein was the son of Ali. Hossein fought the battle with his greatest might. One by one, Hossein killed the best warriors of Yazid. The enemies were pushed back by the mighty Hossein. Our great Imam fought like a lion. He was the best. No one dared come near our Imam. When he reached the banks of the river Forat, he saw Abbas lying there. Abbas, my brother Abbas, did you see me fight? Did you see me? My brother Abbas, I, Abbas, I wish you were with me. We would have fought the battle together. At that moment, Angel Jibril appeared in the sky and said, Oh, Hussein, Allah is pleased with your bravery. Hussein, the time has come to put your sword down. Shem. I want to take you a little bit forward to when Shem was gloating to Yazid in Damascus. Yazid asked, did Hossein plead with you on the plains of Karbala? Shemr said, yes. Yazid, how long did he, how did he beg? Tell me, you deceitful dog. Shem, I am ashamed to say it. While people sit silently and are not waking heaven with the cry, Ya Hossein. The first time he held up his infant Azhar and said, O oh, soldiers, O oh, shameless people, for three days now my child has, has had no water. Give me some water for my infant Ali Asfa. Yazid asked him, Who gave water to Hussein's suckling babe? Shim, heartless Harmala shot an arrow at his throat. When else did Hussein plead with you? In the battlefield when he had been knocked down. So he pleaded with you, covered in dust and blood. No. Then how was it, and where was it? When the king of religion fell on the ground, Ibn Sa'd said, Who is ready to cut off his head? We ten all swore to kill him. We went to the place where that shining sun, Imam Hussein, was to die. O Yazid, when we came to the place of execution, nine of us fled, and I alone remained. I took the dagger from my belt, and I tied it in my cloak. Then I lifted my sleeve above my head. I had no shame before God. 
In a foul rage, I placed my boot on the chest of the king of Karbala. <laughs> Suddenly, he opened those eyes that see the truth. He looked at me. He sighed and said, oh, shameless Shim. What did he say? He said a word that burned my heart. Damn you, tell me what Hussein said. With his lips dry, he said, I am thirsty. Did you give him order? No, I didn't. Tell me why. I wanted him to be martyred, suffering from thirst. So because of what you did, our faces are blackened. Now tell me, did Hossein cry? Yes, he cried twice. Where? Once when his son Akbar fell to the ground, he cried out, Oh, kind father, help me. The king of religion mounted his horse like the valiant lion. He attacked the army that attacks from the sea of calamity. Sometimes he attacked on the right, sometimes he attacked on the left, sometimes he was busy with the army, and sometimes with the tents. Did he cry when he saw the army of the infidels? No, he did not cry because of fear. Then why? The king of religion leapt from Zulfakar, his horse. Tenderly, he lifted the head of his son from the ground. Tearfully, he said one thing, and the heavens wept tears. He said, I will carry your body to the bridal chamber. He sighed and raised a lament that rose to the sky. Alas, that a youth like you should be filled, felled. He held up the body of that green youth. He carried his body from the battlefield to the tents. Oh, shameless one, didn't your heart burn when you inflicted so many tyrannies and oppression? Shemr said, I am the mother of villainy and the master of tyranny. My heart has never burned for tyranny, never. Yazid asked him, where else did Hossein cry? He said, when I, when I was about to sever his head from his body, was he frightened of death then? No, he had no fear. Why did he cry? Tell me what happened. When the king of religion fell from the back of his saddle, he said, allow me to pray. He was allowed and he performed his wudu with sand. He prostrated himself and he prayed to God. Some time passed, but he did not lift his head from his prostration. Ibn Sa'd said, he is praying that we be damned. Slowly and silently I crept to his side. I heard him. He was crooning like this, weeping and lamenting. He was praying this prayer. Oh God, forgive the sins of my people. What did you do after you martyred him? I inflicted a thousand tyrannies on the people of his house to make you pleased with me. Did you burn the tents to take revenge? Yes, they burned and we went up and, and went up in smoke. And what of Hossein's children? Do any remain? One son survives him and he is ill. Is there anything else you want to say? I want you to bestow a robe of honor on me. Lanatullah <laughs> Alashim and Yazid. We pray and we curse them because of what they did to Imam Hussein. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajim.